While it may be cold outside, things are getting toasty warm at Global Voice Broadcasting. Heat up your winter nights with the hottest topics, the hottest celebrities, and today's best music. It's why Global Voice Broadcasting is becoming your 24-7 home for the music and talk you want right now. Discover your favorite shows and music anytime at globalvoicebroadcasting.com. Comedy and pop share the spotlight and a two drink minimum with your host, producer, director Clifford Bell, keeping the world safe for live performances in intimate settings on Global Voice Broadcasting. And welcome back. Welcome back to my little podcast that could Cab Arabia here on Global Voice Broadcasting. My weekly rumination on all things relevant to the nightclub experience. And I have a very, very special show for you today. I can hardly wait to get started. We are a special two-hour episode today, so uh, make yourself a sandwich and sit back. Get ready. Uh, first of all, it's Christmas time here, so I just wanted to send you gris- Christmas greetings from Global Voice Broadcasting. Gabe hit us with that picture of the owners here at Global Voice Broadcasting, Mr. Gabe Harder in the studio with me today, and Todd Murray. Merry Christmas, happy holidays from Global Voice Broadcasting, and please welcome my in-studio guest today, a very longtime pal of mine and one of my favorite people I work with producing shows. Please welcome Lauren White. Hello. Hello, Lauren White. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Good. We just got back. Gabe, show the next picture, please. We just got back from a trip to, a fabulous trip to New York, uh, where Lauren and Lauren White and the Quinn Johnson Trio were performing at the Metropolitan Room. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So um, we... Uh, we just performed uh, selections from a new CD that we're recording that's almost done. Hopefully it'll be done at the beginning of the year for a spring release. And uh, while I was in New York, I got the bright idea that I would run around with a camera and interview some of my favorite New York friends while we were there. And I would turn this two-hour podcast into a little postcards from our trip. Lovely. And so Lauren is here today to share with me, sharing those video interviews with you. Your journey. Yes, <laughs> our journey, dear. <laughs> so I just wanted, you know, uh, it, it was a trip that we took together. And so I just, you know, you're a, a, a native New Yorker, although really Long Island, right? Weren't you? Didn't you come from? I grew up on, on Long Island, but I went to but, college in New York and I lived in Manhattan for many years before I moved here. Yeah. And, you know, I know that a lot of people have been aware of you the last few years because uh, of your singing. We made a really great album about a year and a half ago that got a lot of attention called Meant to Be. We'll be talking about that a little later, too. But before that, I think not everybody knows your background. And I, I, I've, we, you and I have been friends for a long time, so I do. But I want to let people know you have, had been an actress in your early life. And you, uh, you shared some movies with me one day that I loved so much. Oh, no, no, no. Those were just videos from... Yes, from your career. Yes, in my early 20s, I was, uh, I was on a number of soap operas. Yes. And there isn't much left, thank God, <laughs> archival. But we, I have a few little clips, and I think I really made your, you made d- your oh month my God. <laughs> when but I what, showed you them. Well... Uh, Yes. Primarily because on the the first show that I did, I was married to an actor on the show. On the show. Named Armand DeSante. And <laughs> from, from Private Benjamin. Indeed. Private and Benjamin. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and on the second one, we had all kinds of people who went on to have wonderful careers. And w- someone who was the, the, you know, sort of romantic counterpart to my character was an actor named Jonathan Frakes, who was... Then on Star Trek. Yes. And, um, and just, I think, was just announced to direct a new Star Trek. I don't I know. I just heard that somewhere. Well, yeah. yeah. So I did a lot of, 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 of daytime television in, in my youth. Yeah. 
And uh, I also worked in musical theater. Yes. And um, I had a wonderful time. I enjoyed it very much. I remember I've heard quite a bit about a particularly noteworthy production of where you played, pardon me, as everybody here. Oh, yes. There was a, for those of <laughs> you out there in Global Voice Broadcasting Land, there was and remains the, the flagship theater for equity. It was called Equity Library Theater, and they did excellent productions. And we, I was in a production of Company many, you know, many years ago. We were somewhere the other day, and they were doing, pardon me, you know, not getting married today. And I was sitting with Lauren, and she was sitting next to me. Right. <laughs> we, we all knew. We all still knew it. Uh-huh. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to jump into my first interview because this was a real get for me. One of the, uh, you know, I say all this on the clip, so I won't say it now. But I consider this man to be one of the most influential people on the modern scene right now in the cabaret world, taking it to new audiences, to new general audiences, expanding the prat- platform of what's possible in the world of cabaret. I love this gentleman. He is. He is. He is a New York personality. He is a, one of the leading citizens of uh, the Cafe Society in New York. Let me share with you the great Jim Caruso. Yay! Oh, I'm so very excited today. <laughs> I cannot wait to share this gentleman with you all. I'm in the very prestigious Birdland, uh, 44th and Broadway. That's correct. Well, uh, 44th between 8th and 9th. Between 8th and 9th. And I am with one of the very tallest trees in all of the cabaret <laughs> community internationally. Wow. Jim Caruso. Wow. It is such an honor. Oh, I'm, stop I'm, it. I'm your biggest fan. Really. Stop it. I've known you for decades. I know. And you know, I I really, really, I, I've told Kelly, my friend who's on the camera, that you're one of the most important people I wanted to talk to well, because so I nice. think that you're one of the most influential people in the field of cabaret since like... And that tells you a lot since, about cabaret. Since Andrea and Michael Feinstein, I think you're one of the real front runners of taking it to a bigger platform, oh, getting gosh. out into the world, making general audiences know it better. So Jim I don't Caruso, know if that's true it's at true. all, but I'll take it and, and I thank um, you. Jim currently is writing the success of Cast Party, a concept called Cast Party. Why don't you tell us what that is? Cast Party started about 11 years ago. Uh, it's an open mic night, essentially. Uh, but I Turbo would, open tur- mic Oh, that's night. a nice way to put it. It's kind of an extreme <laughs> open mic, only because uh, we do it all over the country in some of the most extraordinary rooms. Uh, Vegas. Our, our home is Birdland, of course, right. and it does not get better than this. Uh, sound, lights, food... The, the, the cutest dressing room the in the world. The cutest dressing. Ha, the, can, hello? Please. please. <laughs> Who else has? Who else has chartreuse walls? That's exactly I, I ask you. Um, I, but mostly I would say the musicians mm-hmm. that I have uh, on stage. Billy Stritch. Billy Stritch. Nobody better. Uh, on, on bass and drums here in New York, I have Steve Doyle and Daniel Glass. Excellent. And they're just, I mean, they're top of the line. So to me, that's what makes it uh, so extreme, so turbo, and the fact that, and the fact that Jane Monheit drops by, and Anne Hampton Calloway, and Liza, and you know that helps. It does help. <laughs> it really helped put us on the map. Uh, when Liza would come every week, I mean, you know, come on, it it it, it can't wait. And speaking of Liza, uh, that was one of your. I know that you guys have been friends for a really long time. And I know you were in Liza's at the Palace. I was. Which was the um, sort of tribute to Kay Thompson. Yes, the Tony Award winning, I might say. Uh, uh, Yeah, that was an amazing three years of my life. We toured the globe. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, although I can't imagine anybody watching my podcast who doesn't know who Kay Thompson is. Oh, yeah, what are you watching this? Who are you? (laughs) Uh, You know, she, in many ways, I consider to have invented the form of the nightclub act. She was really one of the the pioneers of the whole genre. She was. And you had the opportunity to be friends with her. I knew her very well. Uh, She was the vocal arranger at MGM, as I know you know, Right. uh, during the 40s. Uh, She was Judy Garland's vocal coach, Mel Torme's vocal coach, Sinatra. I mean, you name it in that period, and she helped them find their sound. Right. Uh, Then she said she had a headache and (laughs) left MGM and decided to put a nightclub act together uh, with four guys, the Williams brothers, Yes. Andy and his brothers. Uh, Dick Williams is still around and in L.A. Mm. and just an extraordinary uh, arranger and performer. Uh, So they traveled the world with Kay Thompson and the Williams brothers 
uh, and nobody had ever danced, nobody had ever done sketch work right. in the nightclub act. As I said, you know, at the end of a song that do this, and that was where the choreography ended. Right. Uh, she was she she added this. flying all <laughs> over the stage and dancing and, and doing these crazy, wacky sketches. So she, you're absolutely right. Because of Kay, there was Anne Margaret and Cher and, you know, people that really. Right. Uh, and Liza. Yeah. And you're good pals with Liza, I know. I am. I uh, know. She's been an incredible god. You know, where would we be without her? She's right. an incredible um, asset to this community. You know, I have to tell you the funniest story. I don't know that I ever told you this, but uh, m we first met many years ago because I presented a night at Triad. Right. right. It was your right. show. Lindy Robbins actually. I, can't, I think it was yes. Lindy or Michael Orland. One of the yes, two I introduced think us. And so I produced this evening with you and Billy at the piano, mm -hmm. and Liza came, mm -hmm. which at this point, you know, I was not used to Liza walking into the room. Right. And the, um, and the manager came up to me and said, Liza's with her mother at table two. And I went, now that can't be true. <laughs> Thinking that's wrong. This was, I you would know, remember that. Yeah, yeah, I would know if Liza's mother were here. Yeah. But I guess it was some other figure that she... It was, it, I know exactly who it was, yeah. and it's, it's her, her, one of her best friends, Ellie. Crash, yeah. who who she calls Mama. That's what. It, but uh, and, that's, I, and I just thought to this confused. boy, I thought like, how can you be working here and not know that Liza's mother is not with her? Yeah, no, that's <laughs> hilarious. But that Fredette show was, came that night too. Yeah, it was quite Fredette a night. Was there. No, that was an amazing. You were day. awesome. Oh, yeah. it was so fun. And now, so since then, you've made a, an an album. I I still say album. I guess we say CD. I made these two days. albums since yeah? then. Uh, one with Billy, mm -hmm. uh, a live album, and then we just did one just. Just, 8,000 years ago. Just? Uh, 2011. Called The Swing Set, which is yes. one of the coolest titles. That's such a clever title. I can't title. believe nobody ever named I their album know. that. I know. I looked That's it up. Good. I Googled it. I was the only one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you're getting ready to go to L.A. with uh, with your cast party. Nothing makes me happier than bringing cast party to L.A. Yeah. I love and everybody it turns there. out. It's packed, 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 packed. It's always like a big event. It's so now, fun. You did, it, you did it first at the... The Magic Castle, right? right? And then they changed how they do right, things there. Right. And then didn't you do it at the Renaissance with Julie Garnier? Yes. When she was running Yes, that? we did. We did it once there, yeah. which was really fun. Uh, it's hard to find a room big enough for it, really. Well, thank you. It's, <laughs> uh, it's true. In the cabaret thing, you get you get a big crowd. It's so, so fun. They were opening LA. a new space in Beverly Hills. So tell us about that. My great friend, Dave Koz, uh, an extraordinary Grammy-winning sax player, uh, is opening a room in Beverly Hills right next to Spago on uh -huh. Cannon Drive. Right. The restaurant is called Spagatini, mm -hmm. which is an already successful uh, restaurant in Seal Beach that we've played too. Right. And um, the, oh, you did do it down mm -hmm, there. How'd mm -hmm. that go? It was so good. Wow. Oh and God. a lot of LA people went. They all showed up. Wow. It was great. Uh, we sold out. Uh, and uh, so the front room will be Spagatini. That's the restaurant. Mm -hmm. The back space will be. The Dave Cos Lounge, mm -hmm. and uh, Dave is going to bring in all of his ridiculously talented friends right. uh, to work there, and I think it's going to be a thrill. We're there December 17th. December 17th. So anybody who's watching this in real time, check that out. Right. Uh, is Dave Cos Lounge a place unto itself, or do you go to Spaghettini? Do you know? Uh, this in remains terms, to be seen. I so haven't been there look yet. up one or the other. There is. I know it's www. Uh, Dave Ka no Spagatini BH dot com for Beverly, Beverly Hills. Hills. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's how you got it. And then it. so I know you've done Vegas a lot. Yeah. So what's that like when you go to cities outside of New York or LA and and you say open mic? What that I seems know. dicey to me. It I know. It sounds very dicey and it seemed dicey to me too. Um when you live in New York or LA you think, well, all the talented people are here. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Guess what? So not. Yeah. I lived in Dallas for 15 years, and I knew there was a ton of great talent there. Everywhere we go, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, uh, Orlando, Austin, everywhere we've done Cast Party, there is an, there's an incredible community of talent. Wow. And they find us happily. And, um, and it's always you and Billy, right? It, yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. a team. We're a team. You're the Sonny and Cher. Right? We're the Sonny and Cher of the open mic. <laughs> That's a horrifying thought. Yet yeah, makes me happy. Yeah. Hmm. 
Uh, and sometimes here, uh, do, uh, Ted Firth plays sometimes, yeah? Yes, the I great love Ted, Ted Firth. Firth. Yes, absolutely. He's fabulous. And um, also, I wanted to talk about you did a town hall event yeah. as like a superstar yeah. cast party. What was? Yeah. Tell me more about that. That sounded well, like such an incredible night. It was. We've done it a couple times. We did it at Town Hall twice. Scott Siegel, uh, who produces a lot of the mm-hmm. town hall events, the Broadway events, asked me uh, to do it, and we put an all-star cast. We pulled it out. We opened with Cheetah, closed with Liza. The first year, it was unbelievable. Right. Uh, second, you know, we yeah. opened with Cheetah. You know, where do you go <laughs> from there? Where do you go from there? Uh, but somehow, we figured, a, you know, we figured out a, a great schedule, and it was so much fun. Uh, did it the second year, really fun again. Uh, then this last year, we did uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, Mm. In that incredible room Rose. that's all glass. Rose. No, and oh, the, the, the glass room. Yes, the Anderson it Cooper was room. called. Yes, yeah. yes, it was called the Allen Room. Now it's yeah. called the something else room. I don't know. Somebody gave more money. But that's beautiful. Oh my yeah. god! And it was cast party goes to the movies. Oh, and who opened? We, uh, well, it was Billy and I opened. We had uh, Jeffrey Denman doing Fred Astaire material and tapping mm. his feet off. And uh, uh, Jane Monheit, Marilyn May, Christina Bianco, Clark Thorell, um, Natalie Douglas. Oh, God, other yeah, people that I the love and adore. It, yeah, yeah, it yeah, really yeah, was yeah. terrific. Now, speaking of, uh, so uh, it's, you're doing a holiday show right now, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, we're getting ready. With Jane. No. No, with Clea. We just did a, another Hollywood you Land. You did movies. We did Hollywood movies Land. with Jane. Yeah, we did, yeah. we did a week here with the incredible Jane Monheit. Yeah, who, she's incredible. You uh, haven't you know, lived till you've sung next to Jane Monheit. You want to shoot yourself in the face. I, her pitch, her everything is so easy and so beautiful and and perfect. I, and um, there was me. <laughs> I uh, I was I went to see my friend Quinn Johnson play jazz at the LACMA, the, mu- the yeah, yeah, museum yeah. in L.A. And uh, his drummer is a friend of mine, and Kevin Winard, and um, we were hanging out talking to a his drummer friend, Andy, right? Is that right? And the Andy s- summoned his wife over. Oh, I want you to meet Jane. Now, I'd met Jane before, but it was Jane. Oh, Mom not Andy. Andy. Ricky. 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 She's Ricky. not married to Andy. No, she's married no. to Ricky. <laughs> Don't get So nervous, we're Ricky. standing there talking to him, and then let me, let me have my... Oh, he was with the little kid. The, yeah, the child. Jack. And... And we were playing with Jack, and said, "Let's get the mom. Let's get yeah. mom over." And yeah. mom was Jane Monheit. Yeah. You know, she she was like in a baseball cap, and you know, she was. She's a mom. And so. And then the most glamorous, you and, know, forties movie star. And so we were talking, and I had met Jane before because I, I had her at Feinstein's in L.A. Mm-hmm. when it was there, mm-hmm. but it was a long time ago, so she didn't know me, and. Uh, and I she and I was introduced as that I produced a lot of cabaret, and she went. <gasps> He's my favorite person. That is <laughs> hilarious. That's what the first words Here's out of how I feel. Do you know Jim? That Jane Russo? even knows my name is, is thrilling to me. I've been a gigantic fan of hers forever. Yeah, she's beautiful. And what a gorgeous sing voice. With her, oh my gosh. Yeah. And we put together a really fun trip so show. So you did that already. We That's did that over Thanksgiving. Just the last month, here at right? Yeah. But I want to bring it to LA. Yeah, you should. It's fun. Yeah. But yeah, you're, we're doing a Christmas show with Clea Blackhurst. Yeah, she's so great. Another yeah. goddess of the. How cabaret. exciting was that to see her in the Marvin Hamlish event? Did you saw that? I yeah, assume, really right? Really great. Well, On I know TV. he loved her so much. Yeah. And um, really, her the song that she sang was one of the last things that he wrote. Mm. Uh, and it's about, I forget the title of it, but it's about enjoying life right. and, and spending, you know, taking time to enjoy life. Yeah. So really. It, it was a spectacular I, I just thing was so for happy for her and proud for her. I, I only know her in passing. I met her a few times. But, you know, superstar, 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 superstar. And now the final big moment is I Clea. I just thought, now, there you go, girl. There you that go. was a gift, wasn't it? She's a gift, I'll tell you. We have such fun together. And yeah. we rehearsed yesterday for the first time in a year. Mm-hmm. We, we've done this show, this Christmas show, five years in a row now. And... Um, we're like the Bruckettes. <laughs> we won't go away. Uh, and we a just, New York institution. Yeah, oh, thank you. We should be in a New York institution. And we just laughed the whole time. I don't know if we sang a note, but God, we have good time. Yeah. So we'll be here at Birdland all, all Christmas. Great. Christmas week. Christmas week. Excellent. Yep. Here in New York, Birdland, Christmas week. 
uh, Clea and Billy Stritch. And then Jim and Billy Stritch in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, on December 17th. I have it on good authority that some amazing people are showing well, up. Yeah. I'm not going to name drop, yeah. which is very hard for me, if uh, you know me. Uh, we opened with Cheetah. Yeah, right, exactly. We opened with Cheetah. <laughs> good night. <laughs> um, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank I'm you. I'm happy it's to be here. Great, yeah. You know, it's a crazy crunch time, and we're all running around, and it's raining, and it's hard to get around New York, and Jim really went out of his way to make time for me, so thank Please, you. Please, would any time. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Yay! That How was fun a great is that? little interview. Isn't that Love fun? Love the conversation. I'm so happy to have that. Gabe, will you show some of these pictures here, please? Jim and I took a selfie. Uh, you know, as anyone knows, I'm a selfieist. Uh, and then this is Cast Party, what we spoke of earlier. It, you know, that thing has taken New York by storm. It's one of the must-see things in New York and now going all over the place in L.A. December 17th. If you're watching this in real time, that's two nights from now. Go see it. And then also I just wanted to give you a glance at the Birdland stage. It's a beautiful club. Uh, we decided to film in the dressing room because it was easier to set up. Uh, the club was all... Uh, wasn't we weren't able to film inside the club that day, but it's a really beautiful club, and that's a look at it. And now I want to take you over to the Metropolitan Room, which is where Lauren and I just performed. We did. Yes. Well, I didn't perform, but that's inside the Metropolitan Room, and I'm going to show a clip of uh, Lauren singing in a little bit, so you'll get to see that room in action. Uh, and uh, but. One of the people we happened into, I had not prearranged this, was Bernie Fershpan, the owner of the Metropolitan Very Room. nice guy. Very nice. And he loved you, <laughs> I'm going to say. He loved you. Wow. Uh, and so this is us uh, downstairs. They have a whole second floor, like green room area. Uh, and he let us film a bunch of interviews down there. So here's Bernie. Well, well, welcome. Um, this is a very happy accident. I didn't know I would actually get this gentleman. Mm. I'm really excited to finally meet because we've had a two-year or more than two-year relationship, relationship that, by email. By email, yeah. We have a, we, we talked a close. lot, done a lot of work, did yeah. a lot of things, no. and never actually met face to face. No, it's so about time. it's on camera. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised to meet you. Actually. Bernie Fishpan. First pan. First pan. Close. First pan. Uh, who owns the Metropolitan Room? And who is responsible for all the revitalization and all the re-envisioning and all the remodeling and everything that's right. gone on here? Right. Tell us about it. Well, I mean, it's a, it's part of a bigger picture. Yes. Uh, the bigger picture is to um, reawaken the cabaret community uh, to take a leadership role in cabaret and uh, to make it a viable option for showgoers, uh, people who want to see you know, live entertainment, mm -hmm. uh, and it's really, we're taking on that responsibility. It's, it's bold, it's, um, it's a huge responsibility, right. and we want to do it right. Well, you run the club beautifully. It's like, I, for anybody who has not been here yet, uh, it's a fabulous club, beautiful environment, and the best lighting in the city, in my opinion. And uh, I know that you uh, do a lot of you you do a lot of focused marketing, uh, and and you promote the shows and you promote packages and ways to get general audiences yep. outside of just the general cabaret. The, That's correct. The general cabaret goers. That is correct. I agree with you. Yes, That's exactly. What so we're you doing come here. to this from a business background. Right? I, yeah, you have to. In order to run a club, you really can't be an entertainer. Mm -hmm. You need to think from a business point of view. Right. You need to understand how a business is run. How a we run this business like a corporation. Mm -hmm. We break it down into seven divisions. We have department heads, and everybody's responsible. And we're working all the time as a team to provide an incredible experience for the audience. That's the bottom line. It's the the, the metropolitan experience. It's all right. about not just a great entertainer, but it's the entire experience as soon as they walk in, yep. the food, the drinks, the environment, the music, the sound, the lighting, all of yep. that is all part of the experience. It's like going to a restaurant where you hear the dish is amazing, but if the server spills it on your lap, no matter how right. good it was, you may not go back. So Absolutely. it's all part of the entire package. Yeah, no, the sound and the lights here are beautiful. <laughs> The staff is wonderful. We would like to set a standard for other cabaret mm -hmm. venues and any cabaret venues that are opening up. We want to create a standard for them, and it's a standard of excellence. So um, my, the theme of my podcast is uh, live entertainment in intimate settings. Yes. So 
Uh, is there anything you want to say specifically to the people who watch me? Um, you know, I'm mostly West Coast based, but it's uh, it's the computer, so it's everywhere in the world. I thought so. you were around the corner. Yeah, right. Honestly, I thought you were on 23rd Street. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I live in. I'm one of the few like uh, honestly, cabaret people that lives in LA. We're communicating. Cliff and I communicate almost every day. Right. And uh, I assume and here, that you. No, I'm in LA, baby. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you yeah, so much for so coming. So nice to finally meet you face you. to face. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So, what was your so question? anything you want to say to people from uh, in other cities? In other cities, uh, watch out. We're going to be there too. So uh, we'd yeah. like to eventually maybe even franchise the Metropolitan Room. It's uh, it's we're creating a standard and a model mm -hmm. for cabaret spaces. Um, actually, there was some kind of investigation or study, and I want to mention it's a big firm, a uh, big uh, communications and media firm that did a study, and they found that the Metropolitan Room was one of the only true cabarets actually left in America. And so knowing that fact, I said, well, then we have to be the best. We have to really spruce up every single level from food service to the, the quality of drinks to the menus yeah. and the entertainers and, and, and also give a standard to our performers in terms of what we're expecting from them. Yeah. But we, we love seeing people happy. Bottom line is I love standing in the back of the room and watching the performer have a good time and the audience have a great time. There you go. And big success. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Bernie. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. A very, a very good host. Yes, he was. He was. He? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, he loved your show. I want to just say again, he told me he loved your show. When, and he, he, you know, I don't know, I don't know that he goes out of his way to watch everything, but he was there for you. We were delighted. Yeah. And he was very kind. Um, so uh, next, the night before us, we had our, our longtime pal, Alex Rybeck. Uh, you know, Lauren and I first played New York together in cahoots. 15 years ago. It was October 10th, 15 years ago. I don't know how that's and possible. And here is the I... graphic. <laughs> Alex Rybeck was your musical director. Yes, he was. Uh, Michael Orlin brought you and I together originally. He introduced us, but Michael couldn't go to New York for that right. particular thing. He was who we worked with at the time, mm -hmm. but he recommended Alex to us. Actually, Clifford, if I can take a moment, Won't I want you? to help you with this. It was I... Who knew Alex? Oh, really? I don't from remember what I called that. My time in New York, one of my multiple times, I kept going back and forth, and I had taken a class with Sarah Lazarus, oh, and he was the player, right. and I believe he still is. And that, right. and we started working together, and then I came to Los Angeles as I right. did many times, and so it was actually my suggestion that we contact to find Alex. Alex. Yes. Ah, right. I just remember talking to Michael about him, and Michael saying, "Oh, he's great. Oh, you yes. love him. They he's all, the nicest knows, guy." Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so over the many years, we've all become very good friends, and um, actually, I've I've have a quite successful show in the world that Alex and I have done together called Croon, which I will be talking to you about later. But uh, Alex was performing at the Metropolitan Room the night before us with a new woman whose album he just produced, named Celia Burke, and. Uh, uh, I have an interview, so let's go right to that. Good, it was a good show. Great show. All right, well, I've saved all my conversation to take place in front of the camera because I've just been at a fabulous show here at the Metropolitan Room. I came to the final performance That's of right. your run here. Yeah. Uh, sold out, packed to the rafters, excellent, extraordinary, amazing debut of Celia Burke with my good friend uh, Alex Rybeck, who was on my podcast for an hour via Skype a couple weeks ago. Uh, but now I have you in person. Yes. Hey, Alex. That was my Skype debut. <laughs> <laughs> you were um, gentle. I appreciate it. Yes. So Alex and I are good friends. have worked together a lot over the many years. And about two or three months ago, he sent me this gorgeous, gorgeous album. And I fell in love with it and began an internet, a, an email conversation with the woman whose album it is. You can't rush spring, right. Celia Burke. So now I introduce you to the camera. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Very nice to be here. So, Celia, tell me about how this all happened for you. Oh, my goodness. Well, we started working together, it's a long time already. Six, seven, seven years? Six, seven, seven years. And like I was looking for someone to help me arrange some of the music that I was working on, but it quickly became a much more significant relationship right. than that. And we started. What led you to Alex in particular? 
I was wondering that too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't know if you remember this. Ted Sperling led me to you. I didn't remember. A friend of mine it's introduced me. Uh, yes, Very I've never met him in person, perfect. but someone suggested Ted. Ted was just about to start South Pacific. Mm -hmm. He said, "I can't do it, but may I introduce you to my good friend Alex Ryback?" And we'll I start certainly at the top, knew he. Baby. Yeah, I certainly knew who he was, and I said, "Yes, please." Yeah. And I wrote to him, and he and said, "And I'll have to thank Ted Sperling." Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Rec exactly. So that's him. that's how we started, and we've just been on this journey together. Well, it really is a beautiful collaboration. Your album, you know, you have such a warm. Um, your gorgeous alto voice and uh, your selection of music is it's contemporary feeling but it's also very uh, vintage feeling yes. and classic and and having just seen the show you yes. carried that through as yeah, well it's exactly. gorgeous so and you're the toast of the town I'm, I'm so not everybody gets to have such a uh, great acceptance from New York I'm very, you know very right fortunate. out of the gate really well. yeah I'm very yeah. Very did you do three performances we did or four? Three. We did three. This three. was the last we did three of the weekends. three. Were they yeah. all as packed as this? They kind of were yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I think this was the first that was officially where they were sold out. People away. Yeah. Where and you had a lot of notables. I know. Tonight, Tex Arnold. Tex was Arnold. There, could we sang one of his songs. Margaret Whiting's daughter, Debbie. Was oh, was there. she? Yeah, she's, yeah, that was her second time. And you said Billy Goldenberg. Billy was Goldenberg here. was here last week. And I think so Anne Hampton Calloway yes. came, didn't she? Yeah. Yes, she's she's just, her, the title song of the CD yeah. is written by Anne. And she's just been incredibly supportive Gorgeous, and, and kind, yeah. and it's just such a beautiful song. Yeah. So. And if and when you watch Alex's hour-long interview with me. You, she's he's a musical director for the Sisters Callaway th that have had several very successful collaborations. They're okay. <laughs> they're okay. Those I've heard girls. Of them. No, they're. And did you sing at Alex's night at Fifty Four Below? I didn't no, know. but she was at a Why? front table. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Well, <laughs> well there will be fourteen singers Yeah, now next stage. time. Yeah, there'll well, be the more. Yeah, there'll be more evenings. Yeah. Yeah. More yes, songs, more yeah, It was an incredible evening. I'm and sure he had it was. people there who had a first hand connection to every one of those songs. Yeah. So how did it go? I hadn't even it was talked incredible. to you since then. I mean I've read the reviews. No, 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 it was incredible. I read, the, I, I read Anne's Facebook post the next day. I've just come amazing. from the most amazing evening. It was an amazing evening. Yeah. It, it was, was remember that old T V show This Is Your Life? Yeah. It was like that for me. All right. Because I've never done an evening, a full evening of my stuff. Right. And everybody in the audience was, it was people from my whole life. Right. From, you know, elementary school through <laughs> people I was just meeting. That was uh, surreal. So, and what happens now? Uh, with You get to sleep with Celia Burke. Yeah. Well, they've asked us to do to more dates back. here. So I oh, look yes. for us here in the spring. Yes, we have Great. to open up dates. our calendar. And yes. we're already uh, brainstorming about album number two. Oh, smart. Yeah. So, yeah, this is yeah. just the beginning. And we, as you know, specialize in what we call hidden gems from great songwriters. Yeah, so now fun. they're coming to us. We don't have to I go never, looking. I anymore. never heard of that Sondheim project you referred to. Uh, it's singing uh, singing uh, Out yeah. Loud it was a movie that never I'm got not made. Professorial about him by any stretch, but I'm pretty knowledgeable. It's pretty obscure. And I didn't know yeah. that at all. Yeah. It's very obscure. Yeah. I think we may only be the second recording of that song. And I right. got a big giggle out of What About Today? Who sings What About Today? I saw you reacting oh in the my audience, God. and I wasn't sure what you were reacting. It looked like a happy reaction. Oh, it was. Like I loved it. And you did it great. Thank you. That's, you know, it's, it's from Barbara's protest album. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think it would, that was the name of the album, right? What About Today? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. But that was an album where she started it in kind of when she was still kind of a Vegas identified type Barbara of Barbara Streisand. Barbara yes. Streisand. Yes. And that was when the year that her consciousness got raised with Martin Luther King and Kennedy and oh, everything. I didn't know where it and she said, I don't want to just make one of these stupid Vegas albums, so I'm going to make something that has a social consciousness to it. And then know. saying, what about today? Yeah. With 45 horns. <laughs> <laughs> So we love that. Yeah, that I love album. his arrangement. It was a, gorgeous. A, you a real it. gift to a singer. Yeah. Yeah. All of his arrangements. So, are and gifts. where do you come from as a singer? I mean, this is a a, a second chapter for you. It right? is a second chapter. So I started out to do this. I got mm -hmm. a degree in theater. I came into the city, and I said, I don't think I know how to do this. This isn't making me happy. Mm -hmm. So I went off, and I have had a corporate career. Mm. But every week would go and have a voice lesson, yeah. and still sing opera and songbook and everything. Right. And then about 10 years ago said, I think I'm ready to do something with this. Mm. So, and fortunately that timed with 
Finding Alex, and then when we were ready to do a live show, I asked him if he would be willing to approach Jeff Harner for me, who I right. greatly admire. Yes. And so they've just encircled me and really... Well, I, you know, I think that's of particular interest to my viewers because, you know, there's a lot of people uh, have that story that they sort of have that dream at the beginning and life for one reason or another takes them someplace else. But you're always like, what if, what if, what if? So when you return to it, mm. it's, I'm really happy to be able to share you with those people because you've done it so right. You know, you got the best people. Yeah. You made a gorgeous album. Mm -hmm. You've debuted yourself in the great club, and everybody came, and you got all these endorsements, and mm -hmm. that's a really nice launch. It, it, you, help, you it be helps to proud. be surrounded by not only smart people, but yeah. kind people. And you done good. Yeah, thank you. You done good, thank girl. You. It's so it's nice to meet you. It's so good to see you. Yeah. This was this thank you. Exposure. Thank, thank you. you. Sweet, yes? Very sweet. Sorry. <laughs> and we let, oh, she, she snuck her glasses back on. My entire relationship with Lauren is taking off I her glasses. I just was looking at this list, and it didn't say come back to live. Come so. back to live. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes, yeah, so the show was wonderful. It was very, very, very intelligently and movingly articulated. It was yeah, extremely very well, well put done. together. And we had the happy accident of having their director, Jeff Harner, who is a very well-known New York personality. And I have an interview with him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Segue. I'm so <laughs> happy to introduce you to Jeff Harner. I didn't know he would be here today, so I'm so <laughs> excited to snag him. We're downstairs in the green room at the Metropolitan Room, and I've just watched the fabulous Celia Burke's show that you directed. I did direct that. It was excellent. Well, it, she's excellent. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm longtime friends with Alex, so I, he sent me the Who? record a while ago, Mr. Ryback. <laughs> and, uh, but it, the show was very well put together, and she comes off great, and it was beautiful. She, thanks. It's a great chemistry between the three of us. I and, you know, you've already been it. on my podcast. I know uh, you may or may not know that, but I, uh, I'm good friends with Andrea Markovici, and she's been on my show, and I showed clips oh, of, right. I think, <laughs> was it a Cole Porter show? Yes, we did a Cole Porter yeah, show. Yeah, I showed a, an extensive reel of oh, the Cole Porter show. Nice. That so was you, a fun night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jeff is one of the top-of-the-top -top, uh, cabaret performers here in New York. You're all over the place. Tell me what's going on with you. Uh, well, the very next thing performance-wise is with K.T. Sullivan. We've been mm. doing a Sondheim show called Our Time. Um. And we did it this summer at the Lloyd Beachman Theater. And we'll be doing it in January at 54 Below. Oh, how fun. It really, it's, it's really fun. And, and he came, which is pretty Really? <laughs> did amazing. he put his stamp of approval? He did. Oh, yes, that's he nice. Did. He, uh, he said to John Weber, our musical arranger, he said, I really love the changes. I wish there were more. Ah, sure very was. interesting. Yeah. So when is that? January 7th and 14th, and then we take it to London to the Crazy Cox for, oh, um, wow. for Valentine's. Wouldn't that be a great Valentine's show? Ah, <laughs> yes. I'm sure people will watch us in London. Go see them in London. <laughs> we'll be there the 10th through the 14th. Now, you've played London before. Yeah. I have, yes. I, I was at the Crazy Cox this year, and um, I also did three seasons over there of Jeff Horner Presents the American Song. I remember that. London. I remember you, you took Maud, right? Took Maud, Maud and, and Andrea, and Andrea. Karen Akers, Steve Ross, Lillian Montevecchi. Yeah. Uh, Katie Sullivan, right. lots and lots. So aside from being a, a performer, you are a producer as well and a director. Yeah, I'm starting to wear the director cap we a little bit more. Hats. I just directed an act for a singer named Judy Mark, and I've also been helping Anna Bergman with mm -hmm. her most recent shows. Yeah. It's been good. Very exciting. It is. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you, you never get out to L.A. much, though, do you? Only to see family. No, yeah, there's... Yeah, uh, I don't know of you, you know. having performed in L.A. You oh, we did a lot. That. I did the Cinegrill an awful lot. Oh, uh, yeah, but and it, back in the past, it, the uh, original Cinegrill. Yeah, like I'm not out there enough to have a, yeah. like a, a fan base or, right. <laughs> or a press awareness. You know, it really does take the press. Well, maybe my out. podcast will change that. You never know. It's in your hands. <laughs> Clap if you believe in Jeff Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad I happened upon you today. Thank right. you for sitting down with us. I'm, I'm glad you snagged me. And enjoy 54 Below in January with Katie Sullivan and London. London. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, a lot of waving. <laughs> a lot of waving. 
Um, so now I'm really, really, really excited for this next segment because I get to finally share with you some of the men of Croon. Uh, for anybody who's watched this show before, one of my proudest projects, one of the things shows that I've done that I love the most is uh, called Croon. And it is starring and built around uh, Mr. Todd Murray, who coincidentally mm. is the landlord here at the Global Voice Broadcasting, along with Gabe Harder. And Todd is a wonderful singer that I've worked with for, wow, over 10 years now, probably. Um, many, many shows. Todd's released a couple of CDs before. But uh, about four years ago, we created this show called Croon, about the art of crooning. The songs before microphones with the invention of microphones. And uh, how singing developed with the invention of microphones. And uh, I directed Todd, Todd. Uh, and Alex Rybeck was the musical director and th uh, the two other musicians Steve Doyle on bass and Sean Harkness on guitar we really, all five of us created it All uh, everybody uh, had a lot of uh, creative input musically and content wise and I'm telling you I feel like the fifth Beatle these guys are so charismatic and it's such an incredible show everybody sings Everybody plays. It's been really popular. Todd's been touring with it. All of them have been touring with it for like four years. And the CD is just now coming out. So I'll show you how to get that in a little while. But here I get to introduce you to two more of the men of Croon. Here's Sean Harkness. All right. I'm so excited I get to introduce my friend Sean Harkness to you. We're here downstairs at the Metropolitan Room, which is a cool, like, green room kind of place they have. And Sean is, I would say, you're the leading uh, guitarist. That's, like, the first call for literally every A-plus gig you hear around New York City in the cabaret scene. If they're using a guitarist, they're using Sean. It's Lucky good to me. see you. It's good to be seen. Lucky Thanks. yes. And uh, I'm excited to have Sean because we we worked on the project Croon, Todd Murray's yeah, Croon, yeah. and uh, the CD just came out. That if you watch my show, you hear about it all the time. But uh, Sean is one of the men of Croon. I feel like I feel like the fifth Beatle because right. you guys are so <laughs> George, it's such yeah. a cool thing. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I wanted to give Sean an opportunity to talk about some of his uh, as the first call guy here in New York. He also has some solo pursuits I wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, the cobbler's kids never has any shoes, right? Right. So, you know, uh, my my solo show is always taking a back seat to the thousands of songs I have to learn for whatever show or shows I'm doing today, which is fun. I love doing that. Um, but I'm also, I was an artist on Wyndham Hill for a number of years. Oh, cool. I've uh, done stuff with Talk and Patty and Will Ackerman and Liz Story and all my, uh, Barbara Higby. Um, and I love playing solo guitar and small ensembles and instrumental stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's going to be a lot more of that coming up this year. Uh, but, you know, in the same way that um, a lot of singers do what they need to do to fund their singing habits, right. you right, know. Right, right. Uh, being an accompanist is what I do to fund my artist habit. <laughs> and you're <laughs> so. super busy. I mean, really, yeah. every night of the week you're yeah. doing it. And I like that. Probably. I like that a lot. Most most days, if not gigging, rehearsing, or mm -hmm. recording. Or and I know you uh, you have something going on with Karen Oberlin. Karen Oberlin and I have a CD out called A Wish. Uh, it's on Miranda Music. And I have another duo CD just coming out. We haven't done any promotion for it yet. Also on Miranda Music, it's just called Duet with Ian Herman, the great piano player. Oh, Ian right. Herman, where it's uh, half and half his originals and mine. And it's instrumental, just guitar and piano in real time, unedited, no overdubs, no nothing. Ah, cool. And it's almost, it's more of a concert format. Uh, we probably won't be doing cabaret clubs. But uh, you know, small concert venues yeah. right. and things like that. Didn't you um, do something for a while, uh, um, like an ongoing gig called duets? Around? Duos, in duos. fact. Yeah, duos. yeah. Where duos. I would host, because um, I work in cabaret, as you know, but many other fields as well. Mm -hmm. And it was an opportunity for me to kind of cherry pick some of the best of the best and and friends right. that I've made along the way and have guests. Uh, you know, film score composers and other Wyndham Hill artists and theater people and cabaret people and blues guys and rock guys and jazz guys and you know, so I could bring in, uh, you know, 
and then one at a time, mm -hmm. just you know, two people together intimately, because I love that intimate yeah. format, which is great. The Cabaravia, Cabaravia, the land of intimate. Many, many years settings. ago, one of my friends said to me, "Well, you're just a regular Lawrence of Cabaravia." <laughs> That's stuck. <laughs> That's right? where yeah. the name comes from. If anybody wondered, yeah, yeah, and so I kind of focus on live entertainment in mm -hmm. intimate settings, which Perfect. covers comedy and jazz and everything, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's so great to be able to have you, you know, you being a New Yorker, I, I, I live on the West Coast, so, I, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't really like to do things long distance. Actually, I, with Alex Rybeck, I did a Skype one recently, but yeah, I don't do everywhere. much of that. Yeah. yeah, as well you should be. Um, so, Sean, thank you for making time to see oh, me. Thanks for it's having so nice. me. And we'll celebrate yeah. when we play okay. Birdland with Todd yep. Murray. Birdland with Croon. In, in uh, April. Yep. Well, that was it right yeah, there. Yeah. Could you? And Sean! <laughs> and now here's Steve Doyle. All right. Well, I'm thrilled to introduce you to a yet another one of the gentlemen of Croon. Croon. One of my proudest things I've ever done, the Todd Murray Show Croon, was put together as a collaboration with me and Todd and Alex Ryback, who you met, and Sean Harkness, who you met, and now Mr. Steve Doyle. That's right. Steve is one of the, uh, he's probably the leading on call, first call mm -hmm. bass guys in uh, New York City. It's certainly them. anything in the, um, in the Cafe Society cabaret scene, you're always at the forefront. Right okay. now, you, you, you do Cast Party with yeah. Jim Caruso and yeah. Ben Stritch. And also, tell me about the gig over at the Carlisle with them. Oh, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. That's the height of sophistication. Right? Yeah, 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 it's pretty swanky over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, up there. Um, right now, uh, Billy and Jim and I are playing um, until the end of December. They've done three months. I was out of town on a tour for, for the last month. With what Tony. kind of tour? It was with Tony Desaire. Oh, right. That's we were, great. We were driving around the Midwest. <laughs> and, and I'm exhausted. We were we were basically in 13 states in one month, so right. so it was a trip. But anyway, so Jim and Billy and I are playing up there tonight. Yes. And guess who's going to be there? Who? Well, the Duke oh. and Duchess of Windsor. So oh. they're staying at the Carlisle, <laughs> so maybe they'll come down and have a cocktail. Yeah. yeah. You know, they like a boozer once in a while, I think. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and maybe they'll sit in. You know. With, <laughs> Well, I hear they sing, actually. I've, heard, I've actually heard they do sing, so maybe you'll get a surprise visit. Who knows? But anyway, that's 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 happening, and then Tony Desaire starts so right. for three months on Sundays. So right at the Carlisle. Yeah. Such a cool gig. Such a beautiful yeah. room. It's nice to have a steady, another, you know, yeah. steady gigs are good. And, you know, and, you know so working. I've known Steve and worked with Steve a lot as a bass player. But one day, he sat down, and all of a sudden, he's playing the piano and singing, which was a side of him I never even knew. <laughs> That's so right. You, you played well, My first sing. instrument was the organ. Really? So so that was something I felt a desire to do, is to make a record, and uh, I used to sing. and I, So I made a, a record where I sing and play piano. Right. Well, and what's that called? Home to You. People Home can you. get that? They Home can get it you, on Steve Amazon, Tyler. or just give me a call, and I'll, uh, I'll send it to you, or give it away. <laughs> Yeah. So, all right. All so that's, right. That's uh, that was a big deal. That came out um, a year and a half ago now already. So cool. Yeah. And uh, Steve wrote several of the cool arrangements of uh, Croon on our album Croon. That just we, yeah. we started doing Croon about four years ago, but it just now became a CD. Yeah. We just released the CD. You 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 did brilliant work on that. Thank by the you. Way, I so appreciate it. As you usually it. do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And um, as did you, and they sing. It's gorgeous, and the the uh, the arrangement. You did. You did miss the Saturday dance. That's yeah, you, right? Yeah, yeah. That was you. Yeah. Now tell me, you were just so talking about that you're doing a children's album. I am. I did. My friend Paul Denny uh, uh, called me up and said, Hey, you know, he has a daughter, and he said, Hey, I got I have some lyrics. Can you put some music to them? So I right. said, Sure. And I wrote like 13 songs to his lyrics, and pretty soon it started to have the shape of like a story. And so now he's uh, turned it into a musical. He wrote a script, and, and ah. it's being produ uh, produced by someone in, in Charleston. Uh, is this your first time doing anything like that? Yes, it is. Wow. Yeah. So it well. was, it's for kids, you know, and it's pretty fun. You know? Excellent. Yeah, it's like a rock and kind of rock and music, you know. Excellent. You know, so. Well, I'm so happy. Thank you for making time for me today. You know, I could make for having my, me. my New York friends. I'm like, come see me. Come yeah. talk to me, and he's racing around, has to get to Carlisle. But thank you, Steve Doyle.
Yay, I'm so happy to be able to share the men of Kroom. I love those guys I'm so. really looking forward to that album. Yeah, really it's really, forward. really good. And those guys are so great. Um, but now there's another album I'm really looking forward to, your new one. Well, now, first of all, I should say you, you we all together made an album a year, uh, about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gabe, hit us with that graphic. This is just a lovely picture of you and me and Quinn. Oh, yeah. Somewhere. At the ca at, the at Catalina. Catalina. At Catalina, yeah. And um, so come back to us live, if you would, there, Gabe. And so about a year ago, we made an album called Meant to Be that was absolutely gorgeous. And we got a little bit of attention with that. Got quite a bit of attention, I like to think. And, um, you know, it's an interesting hybrid of your sound with Quinn, because Quinn is a very accomplished jazz musician, and uh, you are a beautiful singer. You you have a very warm, textural, alto y sexy voice. Ooh, la di da. And la di da. And, uh, and, and you have made the artistic decision to really let Quinn go with uh, adding a lot of uh, musical exploration to right. the arrangements. It's not just like a put on an album and it's, you know, 12 cuts of the Great American well, Songbook. Well, I wanted to do something that I liked. Yeah. And I had the luxury of being able to do that. And, and I just love the, the invention and the artistry and the imagination of Quinn as a mm -hmm. musician. And I've learned a lot working with him. So for me, it was a very uh, successful, synergistic coming together. Absolutely. And got a lot of uh, validation for that as well. So now we're making a new one, which is a very interesting concept. I'm just going to touch on it a little bit here, and then Quinn talks about it quite a bit. So we'll let his interview tell us more about it. But uh, when we were having the CD release party uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the very Im uh, Acclaimed music reviewer Don Heckman, uh, the last, one, of, one of the leading Los Angeles music critics, made a passing reference to that you were reminiscent of Irene Kral. Now, I had known who Irene Kral was because my our, our mutual friend Susie Mosier, a fabulous talent, uh, was a big fan of uh, Irene's. She introduced me to her a long time ago, but I don't think you had known her when he made that reference, right? No, I hadn't. Let's uh, let's go back to that. Quinn, uh, Gabe, show show that that's there's Irene there. Okay, so go ahead and tell us your first thoughts when you read that review. Well, I was very flattered, and then of course I quickly went on to the you know exploration of who is that and what is she recorded, and then what was interesting about it was that. We, on Meant to Be, on our album, ha had recorded a couple tunes that she r did. And on an earlier album that I made with Michael Orland, I had also recorded something she sung. So clearly we were, you know, simpatico in that way. Right. And I started looking into her discography. She wasn't a composer, but she sang and recorded a great deal. And I just loved her taste. Right. And I really related to the way she sang. She was attuned to the lyric always. She was cool and a jazz singer, not a scatter, but a, a very uh, intelligent and soulful singer. And she sang a lot of ballads. I love to sing ballads. And so I started this journey and brought Quinn in and got, you know, you involved. And, you know, we've been having a a really interesting time. An adventure. Well, and, and also sort of how do we translate that into 2014, right. 15, whatever this is. You know, I mean, those those were iconic recordings. They stand alone. They're excellent in their own right. But mm -hmm. they're, we live in a different time now, and we mm -hmm. have different things to say musically. So for, for us, it's been very stimulating to try to figure out how to, right. how to make that work. Yes. So we we like to go to New York at this period of time. It's it's for anybody who's not watching this in real time. It's uh, mid December. We just returned from performing in New York. Uh, we go. Quinn has a day job where he's the musical director for Steve Terrell. And uh, twice a year they sit down at the Carlisle for a month, basically or so. Six weeks. Six weeks. And so we always like to go at the same time just to kind of sidecar to the Steve Terrell gig. So whilst, while Quinn was at the Carlisle, the fabulous Carlisle, where I, too, have done gigs, it's such a fun place to go. I, I want to say when I was working at the Carlisle, um, 
I was in the elevator and the, the guy that, that runs the elevator, you know, in New York, they have people that actually stand in the elevator with you. And the guy looked at me and said, you look like Marlon Brando. <laughs> Which I have to say, was no one has ever said that. During Apocalypse Now Well, <laughs> it wasn't during Streetcar. It was like, I'm sure, during Island of Dr. Moreau, <laughs> tragically. But anyway, I, that was, that's, that's a cherished comment. Uh, anyway, the, so while Quinn is at the Carlisle, uh, we had him over at the Metropolitan Room. And while we were rehearsing, there's a cool space we use, uh, Machico Studios, and we grabbed a corner and I interviewed Quinn. So here we go. Hey. I'm so excited to introduce you to my pal Quinn Johnson here. Quinn's been in the studio once with us when I first started. I think you were on my second show. Second show. When you were you were globe trotting, you had just gotten. Where were you? You had gone like all over the this world. A couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, probably in Cape Town. No, Johannesburg and then uh, Brazil. Oh right, right, back to back. You yeah. were like. Rah, 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 rah. Anyway, t right now we're at uh, Mashiko Studios in New York City and. Um, we're here tonight getting ready to do the Lauren White and Quinn Johnson Trio show at um, the Metropolitan Room. And we always come at this time of year because we kind of sidecar on, gig, on Quinn's main gig at the Cafe Carlisle with Steve Terrell. Um, and how is so that's that why. going? Oh, it's that's going why. well. It's going well. Yeah, so this is your 10th year at the Carlisle, right? 10th year in a row with Steve at the Carlisle, yes. Yeah. Now, you've been his musical director for a long time, right? Longer than that, yeah. I don't even know. 13 How did that come years. about? Uh, well, I met Steve um, doing a recording session. He was producing a session for Showtime TV, I think. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be called to play. And he said, you know, hey, I have a record coming out, and right. I need a he piano said, player. I like you. I think I need a <laughs> piano player. So. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. So and you so that's been a big day job for you. I mean, yeah, that's a good part of what I do. Yeah, I know that whenever we need to try to do something with you for Lauren's project or anything else that we try to work on, you yeah. got ninety percent of your time yeah. is pre-spent. It's with, a good half of the year if you put it all together. So. Yeah. Uh, also, you have another pretty fabulous uh, kind of day job with the Claire Fisher Band. Yes, the Claire Fisher. Uh, there's various groups. Claire Fisher is a sort of famous or a very famous composer, arranger, piano player, mm -hmm. who has passed away a couple years ago. But uh, his son continues the bands. There's various bands, and uh, I'm, I've been playing piano even before Claire died. He wasn't really playing much. He was just sort of hanging out. Right. So. But it's quite a uh, uh, position of distinction to be. Yeah, the it's a serious because it's a is, very difficult chair because he he legend. was an amazing p yeah. player and he wrote super difficult stuff because he could play it. So you know, I you know that my brother has a long history with Herbie Hancock mm -hmm. and he was telling me that Herbie Hancock says Claire Fisher is the yeah. most inspirational player. To yeah, hear. I remember I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Claire is he was a serious cat. So it's a cool thing. Mm -hmm. We've done several records. Uh, won Grammy for Latin Jazz Record of the Year a couple years ago. So yeah, it's a good thing. And you have your own pursuits. You've released. I know you have a Quinn Johnson Trio album, right? I do. It's on a Japanese label uh, several years ago. And then you also have a solo piano. Solo piano things. Quinn released. Johnson bits and pieces, right? Tunes, bits, and other pieces. Ah, tunes, bits, and other pieces. And I know that uh, recently you've had some of your music featured in the Homeland. Yes, DVD, right? it's uh, well, it's sort of you know, it's in it's in there in one of the episodes they put one of the songs in. So that's ah, cool. very cool, yeah. very cool. Um, and so tell me, we're in the throes of to get working together on uh, making a new Lauren White and the Quinn Johnson Trio CD, mm -hmm. and this this will be the first time we've actually said anything publicly about what the theme is. It's uh, basically a look at the work of the great singer Irene Kral reimagined through Quinn's really beautiful arrangements. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, I think uh, it, the whole thing is inspired. Lauren was inspired by uh, Irene Kral. I think she was compared somehow to A Irene. reviewer yeah, mentioned. Yeah, okay. So yeah. she got interested, didn't really know who she was, and uh, just got interested, and so we just started picking songs that Irene had sung. And uh, the cool thing about Lauren is she lets me go nuts with the arrangements. I just, like, literally, whatever I do, the craziest thing, I'm thinking, this isn't going to work. This isn't going right. to work. Lauren says, I love it. It's my favorite part. <laughs> right. So. And, and we made one album already. We made an album about a year and a half ago called Meant to Be. And, you know, it really, it's its own uh, unique thing. It's, it, it fits in a vocal jazz kind of uh, medium. 
It's very beautiful music, very accessible, very melodic. But also she gives a lot of room to the musicians, you know, led by Quinn and arranged by Quinn, that there are pa a, kind of an adventure of passages of music yeah. no, outside they, of the traditional song format. Yeah, the music is important. It's not just the song. It's not just the Singular. lyrics. It's the entire yeah. thing, which is, you know, sort of why musicians, instrumentalists get into it in the first place. So it's kind of nice not to just back up a singer. You're actually going to yeah. play. So we've actually we got a lot of great reviews and a lot of airplay and you know a lot of nice reaction to this kind of category breaking kind of record. So this I think in a way it's a more step to something maybe more commercial, but then again you know we're still being kind of goofy with it. Yeah, no, they're they're all standards. They're songs that most people would have heard, especially you know fans of this genre in the first place would know these songs. Yeah, um, but the you know why do it the same way again is my point i never see the point of just doing the same song yeah when you this, can yeah. listen to irene crawl you know? why not listen to irene why not listen to billy holiday why not listen to frank right. sinatra then why you know why do it the same way so try to find a different way to approach it and uh, the song is still intact didn't change the melody didn't change the words it's mm -hmm. still the same song it's just the uh the surrounding you know accompaniment so yeah, and it's it's been a very interesting project because Irene Krall was a very interesting woman. She, she I consider that she was sort of like a a, a forerunner to um, Ava Cassidy, who was another woman who died very young but left this body of about ten or fifteen albums that are literally just cult. Uh, they have a rabid fan base within the jazz community, and um, you know we have the special treat and and kind of a beautiful validation of that Irene Krall's daughter who is a musician herself, uh, has become into the fold of, of working on this project. And we've got some sessions set up mm -hmm. for to finish the album with her playing on a few tracks. Yeah, so that was great. a trip, yeah, having her. Cool. And Quinn's, uh, part of Quinn's trio that's on the album are uh, Trey Henry on bass and Ray Brinker on drums. And Trey has a history with... Uh, her she i guess didn't they go to college together or something with, or they, with the daughter yeah with, with irene's daughter yeah with irene's they daughter, went to Jody. northridge Cal, uh, california state university northridge together yeah and so. he says she's a very accomplished yeah musician. she's a professional she plays a in studio player. orchestras in la so. yeah so quinn has arranged a few things um giving giving space for sort of featuring a, a jazz cello which doesn't get done much so yeah. it's exciting for everybody involved with that yeah yeah Anything else you want to say to the folks, Quinn? We got to get to our gig now. Got to go work. <laughs> All right. Bye. All right. I, I've known Quinn for 10 years. I haven't next heard him month, speak so much. And I've never heard him talk so much in a row. <laughs> He's a laconic ch yeah. chap. But a very, very talented fellow. Oh, my God. So great. Yeah. We love Quinn so much. Um, and now I'm going to ask you to set up this clip. I'm going to show uh, where I'm, we're going to show a clip okay. from the Metropolitan oh Room. Oh my! Okay. And you know, uh, Lauren and I were trading emails about what what song to show. And you know, my lane. You know, there's so many beautiful, beautiful like romantic -y ballads, and Lauren really excels on those. She's got, oh, you know her you. gorgeous voice. And the Irene Coral music just suits her like a glove. What's what's happening on this record is very inspiring. I know that uh, I'm suspect since I'm involved in it, but uh, when you hear it, I know you'll all like it as much as I do. I but we, but what we decided was to do one of the non-romantic songs, which is a very cool song, uh, and I thought I'd let you uh, set it up. Okay, well, cut me off if I okay. say too much. Uh, one of the things that was attractive to me about Irene Krall was her her uh, she sang a lot of songs that were written by the satirists and the ironists of her time um, and you know in her own way was a social commentator right. and uh, people this, like Dave Frischberg Frischberg and, and Bob, Bob Durow, uh lyrics lyricists like Irene Landisman people uh, friend. Fran Landisman. Yeah. Irene Kroll. Sorry. <laughs> is this live? Anyway, um, this is a tune by Dave Frischberg. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's, it's food for thought today as, as much as it was 
back when she first recorded it. And it's a cool Quinn Johnson take on a on a very great song. Hit it. Take off your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. Yeah. So thank you uh, to Jim Vern for film, filming that and from my beloved pal Mark Saltarelli for turning it around so we could use we it today. We love Mark Saltarelli. We love Mark we Saltarelli. Do, we do. And also I wanted to introduce that that was Kevin Winard on drums yep. and uh, Ed Howard on bass and Mr. Quinn Johnson at the piano and Ms. Lauren White singing. 
Um, so, uh, and Lauren, especially those four glasses of water. Uh, he, nobody would have even noticed them if you. <laughs> well, now you can go back and watch it again. And watch it again. Right. So now, uh, since this is a two-hour broadcast today, and I have many, many more interviews to share with you, um, unfortunately, we lose Lauren now. Lauren is uh, uh, on her way to the holidays, so she's racing out the door. But I'm so glad you were able Thank to be here with us today. Thank you very much for having me. This was really delightful. I enjoyed those interviews thoroughly. And I really did. It was great you. to hear Jim Caruso talk about your history together and, and his history and listening to Alex again and and all the other people who you talked to. And great. there's really fun ones coming up, so please keep Stay watching tuned. for the next hour. Hang and please there. help me thank Lauren and buy her Meant to Be album and then the, soon in the, in the new year, buy the new one. Thank you. Happy holidays you, to Clifford. Lauren. Thank you. Now, I'm going to just, before you go, honey, let's uh, start up the Betsy Ann. This is a very good pal of mine, and I think I explain everything in the, when I introduce her. So hit the Betsy Ann interview. All right, well, I'm so happy to have here as my guest and introduce you all to Betsy Ann Faella. Now, any of you West Coasters, I'm sure I'm not introducing you to because we had you for a really long time. A really long time, And now yes. you live in New York. I do. Hi, I Betsy do. Ann. Hi, it's so good to see you. It's I've known Betsy Ann for a really you. long time. <laughs> I had the great pleasure of directing your nightclub act for many, many years. Yes. And co-producing along with you and Shelley Markham, your gorgeous album, Can I Be Frank? Yeah. But now, after, she, you know, she did one of those self-produced albums that actually had quite a successful life. You toured with that extensively. I it, did. It sold. Did. You got all international <laughs> with it and everything. I did. Yeah, it really, uh, it really opened up a lot of doors. It didn't make me um, rich, uh -huh. but uh, I, uh, I ended up doing a lot of work um, as a chanteuse. As a chanteuse in, uh, well, in London and in New York at... Uh, you know, uh, in London at Ronnie Scott's and mm -hmm. in New York at the Blue Note and um, uh, Birdland and across the country. And I did a lot of universities and uh, performing arts centers. And it was a really was, beautiful album. Yeah. It's to this day, many people's, one of their, the gem albums, it's uh, Betsy Ann's reimagining of the music of Frank Sinatra long before anybody else was doing that sort of thing. And it's really beautiful. Shelley uh, Markham did the arrangements. Yeah, beautiful, really fun and unusual arrangements. Yeah. And Gorgeous art direction, Mark uh, Mark Burnt. Burnt. Yeah. And and now you've sort of reinvented yourself as a New Yorker. <laughs> I'm in New York. Well, so, you know, I, I am I am a New Yorker. I was born in Yonkers, right. New York. And, um, and I lived in uh, Manhattan for, you know, at least a few years before I bailed and went to uh, Los Angeles and the sunny shores of Los Angeles. Yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, where I enjoyed it very much for, mm -hmm. for a long time, and I still love Los Angeles. Yeah, very happy to be in New York. But what made you make the big shift? You know, um, I just wanted easier access to culture mm. and a lot of it. And that's that, an interesting you know, point. That's not to say that LA didn't have culture; it's got plenty to do. There's plenty right. there, but. Um, but it's a little tougher to get to, and not everybody wants to partake of it. Let's put it, <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, yeah. So I just wanted I wanted oh. feet on the ground access to culture is what I wanted. And so, you've yeah. gotten that, I'm sure. Yeah, sure. Yes. Maybe. Every time I come to New York, you're always at the head of the cafe society wherever oh, yeah. I've been. Oh yes. Um, yes. So and and now you have a publicity firm, right? A public relations uh, yeah. organization. You it's mm -hmm. Savoy. Yes, Savoy PR. Which tell I opened, me about it. Uh, I opened in about two thousand and seven, mm -hmm. uh, and I represent a lot of people in uh, the music industry and uh, performers, and I also represent some fine, well, at least one. Uh, artist who works in the design world, mm -hmm. and uh, so I do a lot of you know PR campaigns, and I love music, so it suits me really well. And I, I like promoting um, other artists. That's what I'm doing now. Excellent. Do you miss singing here and there? Well, yes, I do. Um, I miss singing, so and I don't and I don't really sing at all. Right. So uh, I'm 
think I'm going to sing a little bit soon. That would be not, nice. You know, not really in public. I'm just going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> really. Uh, because I do, I do miss singing. I mean, I just stopped cold for a couple of years, and then it started to sort of work on me. And, but I, I actually have not sung in a club or concert since uh, summer of 2011. Wow. Yeah. And where was the last one? Um, it was, it was in Beacon, New York, and there's an art, the Howland Art Center which is gorgeous and um, it happened to be the summer the 10-year anniversary of releasing the CD oh, wow. and um, I knew of this place because I had booked a couple of uh, of artists there at, you know of uh, singers there mm -hmm. and the guy that at the time ran the place discovered my album and he said you have to come here and do a concert <laughs> So um, at that point, I hadn't sung in three years. And so I you did the Can I Be Frank yeah. show? I did. I um, did. I did a big Frank Sinatra what show. What musicians did you use? Um, you know, I worked with um, Frank Ponzio, who's a New York piano player, mm -hmm. and we just we just did a piano vocal. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really funny because that particular night, they happened to have sold out to a uh, traveling seniors group. Oh. <laughs> so you had a captive audience. <laughs> I had a captive audience. <laughs> Of traveling seniors, and uh, we actually had it. to do two shows that night. It was, oh. it was really, it was well, that's funny. a good way to go out, right? It if was. that was going to be was, your yeah. your <laughs> share farewell concert for a while, yeah. that was a good way to do yeah. it. Yeah, and that's a gorgeous place, by right. the way. Oh my God, it's beautiful. Yeah. So. Well, thank you so much for being my guest thank here. So we get the West Coasters a chance yeah. to see you, and Thanks. and actually everybody all over the place is going to look at this. So. Yippee! So that is my very good friend, my longtime friend, Betsy Ann Faella. I, I meant to uh, show you the CD f uh, cover before we went to the video, but that is a beautiful album. This is one of the albums I'm most proud of in my career. Uh, we, Betsy Ann and I produced this along with Shelley Markham. And, you know, to this day, people pop up out of nowhere and say that's one of their five favorite albums they've ever had. It's very charismatic. It's beautifully, beautifully done. And she had a real success with it for a long time. And then now, as we talked about on the film, she's a, she's a very successful with her PR firm in uh, New York, Savoy PR. So check her out if you have needs for uh, PR in New York. Well, uh, probably nationally, but... Uh, She's very um, in the hub of what goes on in the New York world. Um, now, my next gentleman, I think I pretty much explain who he is uh, within the clip. So I'm going to let you watch the clip. And if there's anything with, that's not set up, I'll tell you afterwards. Scott Evan Davis. Okay. Hey. I'm so excited to introduce you to my first date here right. with yes. Scott Evan Davis. Yes. No, I'm so excited because this is a gentleman I've known long distance now for about a year and a half. And then we're for meeting for the first, first time. time. It's in very person. nice. Uh, I first met Scott. I first heard about Scott when my friend David Snyder. Hey, David Snyder, who was a very well-known uh, musical director on the West Coast who moved to the East Coast a few years back. And he called me up and said, I've been working with this guy. He's a super talented singer-songwriter. He's a super talented uh, performer. He's got this incredible body of work. And he wants to come do the show in LA. So I booked you at the, the Catalina, Catalina Jazz Club. It was, it was all a big hit. It worked really well. And, um, and, and since uh, booking him, when I didn't know him at all, I've now Learned Stop. we have a thousand and ten <laughs> mutual friends. Yes, so true. tell me a little bit about that. That was your show, Picture Perfect, right? It was one of the incarnations of the show. Right. So I did Picture Perfect. My album came out a couple years ago, and then I decided instead of just doing concerts, I would make it into a review. Mm -hmm. And Lenny Watts, who's a cabaret, uh, yes, cabaret director here, he's mm -hmm. a great, great guy, he helped me structure it into a review. And we did about four or five shows here at the Duplex. Yes. Then uh, we went to the Catalina Jazz Club. Club in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, which is beautiful, it, incredible, and um, and then it kind of I put it away for a while. Right. It was nominated for a Mac Award, and then I had an opportunity to redevelop it as more of a musical, mm -hmm. and so I got the chance to go to London this summer. Uh, we did it at the St James, yes, and then right from there, 
um, it was in the Adelaide Cabaret Festival in Australia. Oh, nice. As the review version. So I flew to I Australia. I hear that's that. so incredibly it fabulous. It was so great. And it was funny because at the same time I was there, Liz Calloway, right. Faith Prince, all the, and they're all on my album. Right. So it was really kind of neat just to be there and have New York take so over. So your Italy. album is other performers doing yeah. the music as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. And so give me some of those names again, Liz, so, Faith. Um, uh, Faith Prince, um, the album's called Cautiously Optimistic. So uh, Liz Calloway, Faith Prince, Jason Graw. Yes, my very good friend. I figured you would know him. Yes. Um, uh, I can't think anymore. Um, Karen, Lisa Howard from Spelling Bee. Karen Mason, was she on that? She wasn't on that one, but it's okay. funny because I'm just now putting together my second one and mm -hmm. um, she'll do... She'll do that. That song. On, and you had a night at 54 Below I just recently? Did. Yeah, so when I got back from... Well, the day that I was flying to London... I got an email from 54 Below saying, would you want to do a concert? And of course, you say yes, yes. and then freak out later. Right. Uh -huh. And they said, we need a cast list within a week. And I just, there was no way that I was going to be able to do that from overseas. So I said, can this wait till I come home? So, because I was traveling for a month, and then right. I came home, and then I had about a month to put it together. And that was a real, talk about a night I about of a your month, life. So I, mean, I called Karen Mason. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because I emailed some people and um, I had never met Karen Mason before. Mm. And I just knew her and was a fan of her. Right. And um, I just emailed her uh, 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 off of Facebook, actually. Oh, really? And I said, would you consider singing? And she said, oh, my God, I would love to do that. And I guess she knew some of my songs. Right. And, um, and I decided that I could give her either a song that I had already written. Because the, mm -hmm. the idea of the concert was new material. Right. right, so I had kind of drummed these songs I had to death, so I wanted to do a showcase of new stuff. And I decided to write her a song ah. for that concert, because I thought, why not? Why what not? a great opportunity. And I did, and it was just a really great match. Who else was in that evening? Uh, Lisa Howard, um, Derek uh, from Smelling Bee, mm -hmm. and actually she's coming to Broadway in, um, it should have been you, I think it's called, uh, Derek Klena who was in Wicked and Dogfight and some of the really great things, and mm -hmm. Remy Zakin from Spring Awakenings and um, some other, the original cast of Picture Perfect brought uh -huh. them back. So yes. that was a lot of fun. So, yeah. Now, when I first uh, was setting you up at Catalina's, yes. through that, I get an email from my, at the time, new friend, Kate Bizakis. <laughs> Scott, how do you know my friend Scott? He's been my friend for 20 years. Yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah. Ooh, not that long. Well, whatever it was. <laughs> I don't but. know if it's that long. I gotta do the math. Um, but you know, Kate runs Rockwell. Now. I know. Well, you when know I that? was there to, to do uh, Picture Perfect, mm -hmm. I did the her open mic. Oh, did you? Yeah. Um, I went. I over don't think and we she ran it at that point. Though she was there. She hosted it. She hosted it, but she actually is. The, oh, I get what you're saying. The entertainment director there now. That's amazing. She's taken it over and she's going belting her turbo. high G's as yeah. So Bart. she's a, a, a woman who uh, has lived in, used to live in New York and was very uh, active here. She was in my scene. first concert. And now she's taken California by yeah. storm. She, yep. yeah. yeah, I love her. She's my good pal. She's incredible. She's on my show a lot. Hey, Kate. Oh, well, hi, Kate. <laughs> yeah, she's great. So uh, it sounds like what you're doing with Picture Perfect seems a little bit on like the same track as like a John Bacchino, uh which is my highest compliment. I, 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 I love John Bacchino. I yeah. Absolutely, worse. Actually, it's so funny. When I was a singer, cabaret person, right. long time ago, because uh, I only started writing music four and a half years. Well, four years ago. Oh yeah. Yeah, it just it was a very very new thing in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but back when I was singing, I did my first cabaret show and only cabaret show as a singer, mostly his stuff. Right. That was a huge thing for me. I loved it. I'm asking Gabe to come out of this interview right now because. Uh, I had such a great time talking to Scott. It was really fun talking to Scott. And, um, you know, I needed, I conceived these interviews to all be a certain length so I could fit a bunch of them in. And we just got to chatting and I really enjoyed talking to him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be like uh, Access Hollywood or something, how they always do this. I'm going to show that much of the interview here. And then all the rest of it, I'm going to put on my YouTube channel, uh, www.youtube.com. Cabarabia podcast. My uh, co-producer here, Andrew Apple, runs a, a YouTube page for me with uh, excerpts and stuff from these broadcasts. And I'm going to uh, put the rest of the, the full length Scott Evan Davis interview on that YouTube page. So uh, it'll take me probably a day to get it up. But um, 
please tune into that because we just got to chatting and he um, told a very, very interesting story about how he made the transition from being a singer, performer, to actually being a writer and and how uh, uh, that whole transition came to be. And it was very, very interesting. I, so I hope you seek that out to see the rest of the interview. So now moving along, trying to get so much into the broadcast, here is my good pal, Reva Solomon. And once again, I think I explained everything about who she is and why I'm talking to her in the clip. All right, well, I'm so very happy to have with me here today Reva Solomon. Now, this, this woman lives in Los Angeles like me, and we are daily friends, probably. Daily. We're daily, daily hello on Facebook yeah. people. And, um, but you happen to be in New York today, so I was thrilled to be able to catch you on my little postcards from New York show. Reva had, is one of those extraordinary people who has had her foot in a million pots in show business for literally decades. You said you began in Mer with Merv Griffin. Merv Griffin. Tell me how you got started. Um, I came to LA from Atlanta, yeah. doing theater in Atlanta, and I uh, wanted a job. And the only <laughs> job I could get was being a page wearing the polyester oh God, brown uniform. That? and seated his audience and from there he i worked for him for seven and a half years really and worked on wheel of fortune and jeopardy and all the shows and then was his research director and worked with all the major jazz people that worked on his show right yeah and i and i actually had the opportunity to become friendly with Ariva. Uh, many people who watch my show know Rick Starr. I talk about Rick Starr a lot. He was the manager at Hollywood Sheet Music, and he was a very beloved figure in the cabaret and Broadway musical theater world. And um, when he passed about a year and a half, we had a memorial service. And, and even though we kind of were Facebook friends, we had never really met. And Reva wrote me and said, anything you need help with, I'm happy to do. And then she listed her resume. <laughs> I've produced this, and I've worked with this major star and this major star, and ran this TV show and ran this. And I'm and she goes, if you need me to just like go pick up some donuts, I'm happy to do it. And so, we got together, and she really was of the hundreds of people that loved Rick. She was one of the people I leaned the most heavily on, and it was a very special Thank bonding you. experience. And um, she's in New York for a very, very interesting uh, project. You want to tell us about Hazel? Right. Well, one of the jobs that I've done for 13 years is work with musical director and musician Ron Abel. Right. And he, I call him the unicorn. The unicorn. He, he strikes me as a unicorn for some reason. <laughs> the unicorn. Reason. Blonde braid. That's yeah, what it is. The blonde braid. Yeah. Right. Um, amazing, amazing musical director. Yes. Yeah. And um, okay. he, along with two other people, have written a musical mm -hmm. based on the TV show Hazel, the sitcom in the you Wonderful. know, yeah. So we came out here um, to do backers auditions. Right, with with backers Clea auditions. Blackhurst playing Hazel, Starring amazing cast. You you wouldn't believe how fantastic she is. Like, yeah, oh I would. Shirley, I've seen her. You forget Shirley Booth in two seconds. Right. And Clea carried the show, and it was an amazing cast. And Lucy Arnaz directed. directed. Yeah. Absolutely, and it was great. And so we had three days of fabulous people. Where did you do that? We did that at. I knew you were going to ask me that. And uh oh. I'm blanking. Uh oh. Blanking we'll edit. on we'll the theater. This thing. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but it was great, and. Everybody was enthusiastic, and now they're in the process of talking money with the people. Trying and to get it to Broadway. Fingers crossed wow. in the spring, maybe, Broadway. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, which you know, is my dream. Uh, I did an interview for my show with Jim Caruso yesterday, oh, yeah. and he we were raving about Clea with him, yes. too. Yes. She's amazing. And Jim is fabulous. And um, so, interestingly enough, aside from your work in showbiz, you're also a fine artist. Well, I'm a new artist, really? and I've only done it for the past 10 years. That I didn't know that I was an artist, because I thought that meant you had to draw. And I've always been involved with children's books, uh -huh. and write a column for the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators for 20 years. Wow. And always wanted to illustrate a kid's book. And through that, which I haven't done yet, but <laughs> I've gotten involved in mixed media, assemblage, and I actually got my first piece in a gallery here in New York oh, while I was exciting. here. So I'm very, very excited. Congratulations. Yeah, That's not you. easy to do yeah, in New York, right? I was very, very honored to do that. So, Wonderful. Yeah. And I know that you also uh, 
you, I've seen from some of your posts on um, Facebook that you are into life coaching, that that's something you do professionally yes. as well. Yes. I worked in the entertainment industry in film and television since right. 1978. Right. And um, the, the, the gal's got a I'm resume. 11, but I, you know, but I, worked, <laughs> I worked when I was young. Um, but there, there was a, not a lot of work as a freelance person um, working production. And so at the time, coaching was just getting started. I worked my way into it, and I've been doing it for over 15 years. Yeah. And I, all my clients are creative people. I do everything over the phone. So I have clients from all over the world, and I oh, love it. fun. Love it. And I know you have a lot to share, a lot of information to share, a lot of uh, inspiring to do. Yes. Well, you know, it's, um, it's like holding somebody's hand and cheering them on, but giving them those pearls of wisdom that they already know. But sometimes when you hear it from another person, it's... You know, right, makes it a difference. Makes a big difference, yeah. So. Well, thank yeah. you so much for being part thank of my postcards from me. New York. Oh, thank you, thank it's you. It's such a thrill, Riva Solomon. Thank you. All right, Riva, that was so fun. We're as I said earlier, we're both Californians. So, well, we live in California. So it was a trip to actually be in New York. Finally, getting her on my podcast. Um, I'm thrilled she could do it. Now, my next interview. Uh, this gentleman is d really one of the brightest lights in the Broadway scene. Uh, you know, I don't want to be too hyperbolic, but you kind of cannot not be with this gentleman. He's the most handsome, the most talented, the very sought after, and he's a great, great guy. I have the great good fortune of having been friends with him for many, many years. And uh, he, he was slam, 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 slammed uh, with work commitments while I, for the five days I was in New York. Uh, he did a big production of My Favorite Year playing the Alan Swan part. And um, I'm not an actor, I'm a movie star. And then he went straight into rehearsals for a big production with the Actors Fund. And he literally, just like literally just made 20 minutes for me to happen. So uh, I'm very, very grateful, and I'm very, very excited to share with you my wonderful interview with Douglas Sills. All right, I'm so excited to be able to introduce you to my next guest. I have an honest-to-God Broadway leading man here with me today. This is my pal Douglas Sills, as many of you I'm sure know. Um, since I'm here in New York, that was the first call I made, like, hey, can I come talk to you? And so he invited me over to his rehearsal here at the Ripley Greer Studios. Is that where we are? C'est vrai, monsieur. It's a beautiful place. They Thank you. I own it. I've just refurbished <laughs> the So you're rehearsing for? Uh, it's a new version of Old Calcutta, uh -huh. all naked. I was surprised when I looked in the rehearsal. I've been, you know, I just, <laughs> no. Um, I'm doing a Actors benefit, fund. and a benefit for yeah. the Actors Fund, and it's kind of an interesting thing. It is uh, the first staging of a Christmas piece that was written for television in the 60s by Bob Merrill and Julie Stein called Mr. Magoo's Scrooge, or Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, and they were in Los Angeles waiting for the green light on Funny Girl. Oh, and they really? put their talents to work. I'm not sure exactly how the project came to be, but so there's all these beautiful songs that occur in this animated piece that isn't aired anymore, and so no one has heard or seen. And the idea is, I think DreamWorks Studio owns the rights, and DreamWorks approached the Actors Fund knowing that they do these stage things, and they said, would you like to do it? So long story short, uh, next Monday, with a full 28-piece orchestra wow. on stage, we will live action stage this thing and marry our movements on stage to the length of uh, all the accompaniment that they created. Now, there'll be some extra music that they had to cut because of the constraints of television. Mm -hmm. So, And no one's ever heard this music live. And some of it's really beautiful. And I thought I had not seen this before. And I've heard so many people come up to me and say, I heard you're doing this thing. That's the best Christmas carol ever. That's my favorite. That's the one. I'm like, it's an animated Christmas. And I, as soon as they played the music, it was like... Um, Seemed familiar to you? It was definitely familiar. It was like lodged somewhere between my amygdala and my cerebellum. <laughs> you like mean, you're a the little... first person who's mentioned amygdala <laughs> on the Global Voice Project. Well, you know, we're going for a high-end <laughs> audience. 
It's like a strawberry seed, like lodged in your gums. It's back there, and as soon as they played the music, I was like, "Oh my god, I know this Razzleberry." What? What? And uh, so what? it's been fun. We just started Monday, and the way things go in New York now, everything gets squeezed, whether it's a workshop or a reading. So in one week. All these great, wonderful actors will come in to the studio and they're very organized, the actor's fun, they've done this a lot, and they'll do it. Now you might say, what are you playing in it? What are you playing in it, Doug? Although, I know the answer. Well done, well done, sir. Yes. I'm playing Mr. Magoo. Now, you might say, really? Doesn't seem like the best <laughs> idea. Which is what I said. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Uh, they just wanted to do it and they thought it was more important that uh, whatever they feel like I bring to the project I was happy to do that as a benefit well, for the actress fund because they do great things. You also might being might be being a little humble because even though you have your dashing leading man looks, you're known to be quite a comedian. You're a well, that's very, very well known you. comic actor. Well, thank you. That's very so kind of you. So perhaps that is what's. I love hearing that. As that's of course true. In the in the uh, light now, of the passing of Mike Nichols, who yes. cast me in his spam a lot, which was, you know, one of the great triumphs of my life that he would choose me. Yes. I, you know, it's a great um, feather in my um, genitals. In I mean, uh, pocket. Front pocket, ascot pocket. Uh, and for anyone who might not know, although I can't imagine anybody watching my show that wouldn't, but Douglas was the original Scarlet Pimpernel in the Broadway production of Scarlet Pimpernel. Uh, recently, this last weekend, you just did a big production of My, my Favorite Year, playing Alan Swan. Yeah, uh, the York Theater here in New York does these uh, musicals for Mufti, they call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stephen Aaron and, and uh, Stephen Flaherty and Lynn Aarons had been working on their piece uh, since the 90s uh, when it, it first got done. And it wasn't ultimately successful, and they felt they understood some of the reasons, and they wanted to take more, another crack at it. So they got together with the York, and it was a wonderful cast. But again, squashed into four days rehearsal, a full musical. Now, granted, you're supposed to carry your books, which we did, but it's very yeah, difficult to no. give it a strong reading without really knowing the material, knowing the givens, knowing the objectives in the scene. I know it's, it's hard, but if they start to stage it, you want to be off book. So there's always that stress a little bit. But um, this cast was incredible. Richard Kind, who's an amazing comedic, comedic uh, actor, and a wonderful young guy uh, named Adam Chandler Bera, mm -hmm. Bera, I think he pronounces it, who was in <laughs> Rent and Peter and the Starcatcher and Normal Heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rose Hemingway uh, was the other female lead, and Leslie Kritzer was in it, and uh, Christine Petty. Ah. Excuse me, it was a really wonderful cast, and the chaos of the rehearsal was really countered by how strong the presentation was. I, I was shocked. I mean, I've been doing it a long time. I thought it never occurred to me we would have that kind of uh, thing turn out and have the audience respond the way they did. But uh, it was a very strong weekend and fun and interesting cool. and fascinating to learn how you learn it because you're still in the process of absorbing it so intensely when you're doing it in front of people in that very truncated form. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, the last time I saw you on a stage, and you were absolutely brilliant, was in the national tour of uh, Adam's family. Schmadam's family. The Schmadam's family. <laughs> right. Where he was Gomez. And uh, once again, that was a little bit of a surprise casting, and you were hilarious. Thank you. You were amazing. That was interesting how that came about. Um, the producer, Stuart Oaken, called me when I was doing a new musical uh, for Sergio Trujillo. Sergio was the choreographer of Adam's Family, but this particular show I was working on is called White Noise, and it was Sergio's directorial debut, mm -hmm. and we were doing it in uh, Chicago. And the producer of Adam's Family called, and he said, would you consider this? And I said, no, I'm not going out on tour. I'm, I'm 35 years old now. <laughs> I have to rest. <laughs> uh, I thought, you know, I don't really want to go out on tour. And in addition, first of all, the show, frankly, to be un unpleasantly honest, I didn't think the show was terribly successful for the audience as an experience. And I thought, you know, if Nathan Lane couldn't make it work, plus who wants to follow Nathan? And in addition, on top of all that, I'm not a Nathan Lane type. Mm -hmm. So I said no, and my partner at the time, of a long time, who you're very close friends with, and all yes. of you probably know, Todd Murray. Mr. Todd Murray. Who's a wonderful, My wonderful performer. <laughs> <laughs> who's the dream? He's the dreamiest. Yeah. Um, 
he said, Douglas, I, I think you should think twice about this. And we talked a little bit about it and how it would take me away from home. And I thought, well, okay. And I had another discussion with Seward. And the important thing that came out of it when I called the producer back was they said, no, we know it didn't work. And we, we, we feel strongly about taking another crack at it. Why don't you let me show you the version of the script we'd like to start with at least. And we, we really see the characters different than I, we feel it's elastic enough to take on a different portrayal and we understand that you're not Nathan, we don't want you to be Nathan. And I talked to the very experienced comedic director, Jerry Zachs, who I had done Little Shop of Horrors for, and I was convinced that everybody wanted to take a new shot at it, and in a way I was honored that they wanted me to do that mm -hmm. for them, because they know I'm not going to just follow directions, I'm going to bring something of my own. It brought so much to the show to have your leading man, you know, persona as Gomez. That's that, interesting. That it really, uh, you know, tentpole the show. That's interesting. Place. Well, they also rewrote it so the structure of the piece suddenly became about Morticia and Gomez as opposed mm -hmm. to the children. Anyway, it turned out very well. They were extremely happy. There was all a great deal of new music material, all new book, and it is in fact the edition of the show that's published. Mm, and it is in fact the edition of the show that people are doing now that is being done in Mexico, that was done in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, I think Japan, it, they think maybe London, um, Australia did it, and that's the version they've been doing. So, um, yeah, it was a great honor to be linked to sort of the resurrection of that brand, because the Adams Family, it was a little, you know, it wasn't a successful outgoing for anybody involved. I think there were a lot of reasons, which could be, take up a whole program, but, um, I think they're very happy with what they're left with, you know including, that? by the way, I should mention Andrew Lippa, who wrote the score and wrote some new material for me, um, who I, you know, he's a Detroiter. Yeah, do you as I throw am. a big D? Yeah. Um, you know, and that, that show also was the, uh, the impetus of another wonderful experience I had with you in terms of uh, I coach a few teenage girls that are real talented, little powerhouse coming up. And one of them is a rabid Douglas Sills fan. Rabid Douglas Sills fan. Alexandra Theodora Spurlock. And so when I happened to mention that I knew you, she lost her mind. <laughs> and uh, I invited you to, I, I asked you if I could invite them to come meet you after the show. And not, you know, it was a five show weekend, right? Or four show weekend. No, five show weekend. Yeah. Five show weekend. And uh, you met us backstage, and I think I'd asked you if I could bring two, and I ended up with like six. And you, rather than just like saying, hello, I'm Douglas, you've met me, go away now, you took those girls on like a 40 minute tour of the Pantages Theater. Every floor, the makeup department, the <laughs> hair department, the props, this is the secret door. That was so amazing, and you gave them a little tutorial on being a working actor. Did I? I don't think it was as generous as you think, oh, it was. and I'll tell you why. What was so insidious about my plan? <laughs> it was an evil plan to. I remember the first time I went backstage, and in a way, it it was a bit like flypaper. Once that happens, if you have any inclination towards it, you're stuck. You're hopelessly. And I, my goal in doing that <laughs> was to addict these ladies to the theater, both as patrons, as audience members, and right. as performers or producers, whatever they're going to be. I knew that I had a chance to lock on to and contaminate the minds <laughs> of, of more people. So I thought, well, well no, you I'll put it in a half hour and maybe they'll be addicted to the theater. You did it. Good. You enrolled. I'm glad. Absolutely. Now, the only other thing I knew that I wanted to ask you about is, uh, uh, you know, we've known each other for a while. As you say, I'm very good friends with Todd. And um, it's interesting to me because you're considered by so many to be one of the best singers around. You're a glorious singer, beautiful singer. Uh, but I know that it's some, that you don't really consider yourself a singer. You think more of being an actor. So there have been times that I've like said, "Oh, Doug, come be in this thing, or be in this concert, or be in this cabaret," and you're like, "No, no, no, I never sing out of context." So tell us a little bit about that. I think that's interesting. Well, I did try it. It's not like I just put up this rule, you know. And I just found it it didn't give me pleasure. And after some notoriety came to me, which was you know totally um, by good fortune, and and I'm incredibly grateful for that. I got an opportunity to sing with symphonies and I did that a couple times and I just found that it didn't bring me pleasure. It brought me a great deal of stress and heavy cortisol and adrenaline <laughs> and uh, I found I was not, it, it wasn't fun and I wasn't, I didn't have a great experience and I wasn't able to communicate 
that joy in performing. And I watched some others and I thought that they do do that well, others of my peers. I appeared with the Boston Pops for PBS once with a great group, uh, Audra and Ron Raines and Mary Testa and Lilius White and Rebecca Luker and me. Mm. And uh, it, was, it was a great group uh, with a fantastic orchestra for PBS. And, and while I think I did find um, that seemed to be a good place to end that. So, and I, because of my partnership with Todd, I learned a lot about cabaret, which is an art form I didn't feel a, a tremendous kinship with. And uh, I recognized how many different subsets within cabaret and how different people's uh, appraisals of the art form and um, their tastes can be expressed within the boundaries of cabaret, whether it's more entertainment oriented, whether it's more personal stories, whether it's more spoken word. There's really, it's as elastic again as people's imagination. So I did develop an appreciation for it, but I, I've never found an idea or uh, a premise that I said, oh, that's interesting to me. I would like to do something like that. Mm -hmm. For me, performing, I, I feel like what I have understood about myself is performing is about the synergy of other performers being with me and how the, the addition of all these people is greater than the sum of its parts. And that special magic is is what I really long for, and also rehearsal. So many of the things that you've asked me to do, you know, you sort of have to have a book of things ready. That's the right. ideal way. And you come in and you say, sure, I'll do a song for you. Right. And um, again, in terms of being a singer or considering yourself a singer, it's more of a state of mind than an actual empirical, do you have a voice or not? I find that people who sing in the shower, those are singers. <laughs> people who feel more, most expressed, most fully expressed singing. Mm -hmm. Now I've had some incredible moments of expression and, and ecstasy, frankly, singing. And right. for that I'm incredibly grateful. But it's stressful for me and uh, it doesn't come easily. And I found that w w my entry into singing is all that's an obscene gesture. <laughs> really? I can't believe I just Watch did that. those hands. My entry into singing <laughs> is um, through the character. And when the character is expressed, and when the character needs to sing, and what is he trying to say? Now, the truth is, is if I was hearing that, I would say, well, that's cabaret. You can do that in cabaret. You just put yourself in the circumstance, and you do it that way. So it's really a lame excuse. But that's been my experience. And with the advent of uh, 54 Below, I have started to think, I wonder if there's something that I would like to do, but it always feels, forgive the expression, masturbatory. It feels self-indulgent. So not to watch other people do it, but for me, I never felt like I had something important enough to say that I would want to hear it. So who knows what the future will bring, but um, I'm certainly open to ideas and I'm always thinking about it. Um, you know, you did do one show for me. You came, I did a, a benefit concert in LA a few years back and you very happily agreed, uh, happily to me agreed to come do it and you did soliloquy. And I'm telling you, stunned side, it was like the most profound performance of soliloquy I've ever seen. It was wow. so awesome. That was, that was I mean, a lot. Aside of... from the fact that it was so amazingly sung, it was as you were a character, you know, you were a human being. Well, that's like a heroic that, thing. Yeah. You know, that's the climax or a climax of that piece. And it's fascinating to work on. You work on it as a monologue, like a Shakespearean monologue. And my background is I went to a graduate theater program. And if you dissect it and take it apart and look at the givens and the circumstances of the piece, you know, this is a tremendous moment in this person's life. And it, it's so beautifully expressed in the melody and the keys and the change in harmonies. So in that sense, it was wonderfully challenging and it gave me an excuse to work on it. Um, but I also remember something else I thought I did with you where Todd and I sang together. Yes, you did. You did Old Fashioned Wedding put together with um, My Romance. My Romance, and yeah. that was fun because we, we didn't really sing together much. Yeah, which was very uh, cool. So that was fun. Yeah. So I've done it a couple times, and mostly happily, but um, you know, the sound system is different in every room. That can be kind of throw you off. Is it wet? Is it a dry sound? How does you, you know, I think if I did it every day, and I know a lot of cabaret people feel this way, that I would develop a warmth for it. There would be a, you know, like when a wagon goes down a road, you, right. you start to get a rut where the wheels are, and there would be a comfort in it. But there are so few places and opportunities where you can do something every day for a couple months. I mean, who, you know, Bobby Short, well, who's done it since, right. you know, who gets to do it. So it's a very, uh, it's like lightning in a bottle, good cabaret. You know, you, you have to have it ready. And I just think the people that do it well 
Well, I like the idea that maybe there's hope that somewhere there's down the road. There's always hope. There's a canvas. You know, there. I've had a lot of life changes recently. Uh, I'm an orphan now. My mom passed. Oh. I, uh, Todd and I have split, happily, friendly, but I'm on my own. It, it, and it makes you rethink your life and you think, you know, what was I holding on to these stupid precepts for? So everything is always in motion and there could easily be something. So I'm at a different place in my life. The parts that I get because of this white hair, it, it, that's changed a little bit. Um, and I think you just have to be ready as an artist to take it as it's coming in, you know. It's a little off topic, but I went to see this art exhibit at Pace Gallery here. They're doing uh, Picasso paintings from the last 20 years just of his last wife. And there's must be 20 paintings in there. And they're just the most extraordinary things. You, 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 you just can't believe it. They're, they're, they're so impactful. And they were, this was the, his last marriage. This was like the last part of his life. He had already done so much. I think that uh, there's room for uh, blossoming, I hope, and you know, new things to happen, new buds to come off of the tree at any point in life. So I hope that I'm going to be surprised by a lot of things that go on in the next period of time. I, I'm more permanently in New York now. I'm doing workshop after reading after workshop. I just did a spoof of The Shining. <laughs> Jack Nicholson and Alice Ripley played the Shelley Duvall part, and it was hysterical. But, you know, I'm doing so many uh, pieces, and uh, it definitely keeps you in shape. So act two is looking pretty great. I think it's more like, <laughs> if it's a five-act it's, play, it's, it's the a, middle of the second. I don't know what it is. Right. I don't know. Well, we got to get you back to rehearsal. So thank you so much, Douglas. This is the man who's single-handedly keeping Cabaret alive, certainly on the West Coast. And uh, we're incredibly lucky to have you as a resource, as a teacher, as a mentor to bring new people to the art form and to do things like this, where you extend yourself in a situation that is not necessarily financially remunerative and I'm grateful to you for doing it. So thank, thank you, you, Douglas. Thank you. Can I hug you? Yeah. Bye, see ya. Bye, guys. All right. Isn't that great? I'm so happy that he made time for me. I loved, 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 loved. Thank you so much for that, Douglas. All right, we're about to the end. Uh, I have a couple more things I want to share with you. Uh, first of all, I mentioned the Croon CD earlier. So uh, I don't know if this tells you how to get it. You know, go to toddmurray.com. I know that there's a link there about how you can order it. But uh, it's a fabulous album. Uh, you got to check it out, toddmurray.com. And then also Lauren's album that's been out now for about a year, Lauren White Meant to Be with the Quinn Johnson Trio. Uh, her new one will be out hopefully by April. I think we're planning for an April release. And also... Uh, while I was in New York, I connected with one of my closest friends for many, many years, a woman named Kelly Cardi, who uh, from, we grew up together as teenagers, and um, she has worked at CNN for 20 years or so, and now she freelances around New York producing various things. But she just produced her first film, uh, a documentary uh, with a gentleman named Jonathan B. called The Paper Trail. And it is a very, very insightful uh, – it's interviews with about 12 or 15 authors about how the internet, modern technology, has impacted the art of the creative process of writing. And it was fascinating. I mentioned it to you because my week in New York, while I was there, Kelly had a screening of it. Um, and I was lucky enough to get to see it. So check that out. Look for it. It's, I think there's a Facebook page for it so you can keep up with its journey. But it's people like John Patrick Shanley and really great accomplished writers, New Yorker writers, blah, 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 blah. It's really good. And I'm so proud of my friend for that. Uh, and also I have a little commercial here I want to do for a gentleman named Richard Skipper. Uh, another, you know, the cabaret community we're a big uh, we're a big family, the cabaret community, and I don't know this gentleman well, but uh, whenever I work in New York, I tend to cross paths in one way or another with him. And right before I left, while I was on my way to the airport, he said, "I'm doing a Christmas concert. Could you give us a shout out?" So here's your shout out, Richard. This holiday season, begin a New York City musical tradition with The Many Sounds of Christmas, 
featuring the Salvatones with New York virtuosi and organist Stephen Fraser, all under the direction of Daniel Brondell. Holiday gems, new twists on classic favorites, and even a chance for you to sing along. December 21st at 4 p.m. and December 22nd at 7 p.m. at the historic St. Peter's Church in Lower Manhattan. Visit ManySoundsOfChristmas.com. So if you're watching this in real time, you still have a chance to catch that. And uh, I, let me take a minute to say thank you. We're coming to the end. I have one more interview I'm going to share with you. I'm really excited. A uh, surprise person who walked into the Lauren White show, and I was so glad to get grab her. And she had some really exciting news about this coming upcoming Grammys. So that will go out with her interview. Uh, but before I go, I have a few thank yous. First of all, as always, uh, I'd like to thank my landlords here. Uh, in the studio with me, Gabe Harder, one of the owners. Gabe! Hey, Gabe! I made him be on camera. He hates being on camera. Uh, he's one of the owners here at Global Voice Broadcasting. He's also the office uh, headquarters manager and uh, my personal in-studio engineer because I can't push computer buttons. And uh, Mr. Todd Murray his partner here at the Global Voice Broadcasting. Also, uh, I'd like to thank my co-producer, Andrew Apple, who helps uh, me in so many ways. And particularly more than ever, I'm completely indebted forever to my beloved friend, Mark Saltarelli. But more than ever for this episode, uh, it was Mark uh, who converted all the, the interviews, converted Lauren's performance clip. Uh, di- you know, this, this was hours and hours and hours of work to get all these videos ready for the um, podcast today. So I'm a, a huge thank you to my friend, Mark. I am forever indebted to him for all that he does to support me. And um, I think that's it for now. I hope you'll come back next week. We're going to have a Christmas podcast, a holiday podcast. And then the last show of the year, the 29th, will be another two-hour look at the year in review, 2014, here at Cabaret Beyond Global Voice Broadcasting. So um, I'll say my goodbyes now and introduce you to the clip with my friend Donna King. Oh, we better talk to the Oh, people. my God, I love a cuddly teddy bear <laughs> to hug. <laughs> uh, this is a, a surprise to me, but one of my favorite performers I've ever, 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 ever worked with, Donna King, was at the show tonight. Thank you, sweet. So, fortunately, we have my friend, on ca- my friend Kelly on camera, so we snagged her. <laughs> And I knew Kelly from a million years ago, I too. Know, I and then know. Kelly happened to know you and everything like that. I know. Before Facebook. Before, yes, before the century. Before. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna, but yeah. Donna, I, you know, I had the great fortune maybe two years ago now yeah. of, of producing, working on an iClub act with her. Killer, killer, killer. Uh, <laughs> one of the best triple threat triple performers threat. you've ever seen in your entire life. Uh, don't, I know that you have some major Broadway credits. You yeah. uh, were a cat. I was you a whore were... and a cat and a spider. <laughs> I was, I was a Let's whore and a cat. Let's context that, shall we? I was we? an animal, always So, an animal. Best Little Whorehouse, original production, and original production of Cats. Yeah. You were ballerina yeah. cat? What's no, the I was bomb, bomb ballerina. Bomb ballerina cat. cat. Yeah. And... Okay, horror cat. Uh, horror, horror cat and spiders. Kiss and of the spider, spider woman. Kiss, kiss of the spider, spider woman. woman. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. And, and I also just played Ava Gardner at the Actors Studio. Oh, Wasn't that really? funny last week? Who was oh, the cool. most beautiful animal in the world? They said. Wow. So it was continuing with the animal theme. Yes. Yes. That's so the I didn't know to expect seeing Donna here in New York because uh, as I, what I know is that she lives a lot of the time in London. But I guess you're back and forth a lot. Yeah. I'm back and forth a lot. I've come back to New York for a little while for about. Mm-hmm eight months or so um, not to follow my children because well, mothers don't do that sort no, of thing do they no no, no 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 the mother-in-law jokes are like last century yeah so no I don't do that but I'm going back to London in February t- because my son's child. having a baby <laughs> <laughs> can we mention your son's current big success yeah! 
Can we do that? Yes. I didn't know. They, I happened to go back after three months and they got their scannings from the glam mother. Donna's and, very, very talented son is uh, a, a, the writer of the many of the hits of Sam Smith, who's right. like this zenith rock star at the moment. Yes, Huge. he is. They just got six Grammy nominations. Yeah. And your son is the creator. He's the producer, producer. and the co-writer. You can say his name. Yeah. Jimmy Napes or James Napier. James Napier. <laughs> And you also have a gorgeous, talented a daughter as gorgeous well. Gorgeous daughter who's here named Jesse Napier. Yes. And indeed. she's gonna kick it soon with her acting and her comedy and yes. her art and everything that she does here. Well, so, so James got married. James got married and, and he's, he's having, having a, a baby. baby. Congratulations. Yeah. I didn't know. Congratulations. <laughs> I know we're so so happy. I got the best gr a baby grow. It says what happens at grandma's stays at grandma's. Oh, nice. <laughs> So, so, are you any plans on the horizon to revive well, that act, that, that amazing act? act? Well, I just kind of wanted, this has been inspiring to see your show tonight here again, Clifford. And Clifford did help me coming back to America with doing my first show back in, it was in L.A. And it really was excellent. It was all right, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, more of that sort of thing. And just um, staying creative and uh, probably we'll do some more shows back and forth between London and New York. And right. And uh, just live, really. Live. Live is live. the life is my stage now, darling. Whoa. Yeah. So you know. Well, I'm thrilled that you were here. Thank you so much for nice coming to Lauren's show. Did you did like the show? I did enjoy the show very it was much. Good, wasn't it? A great I was set. Very proud and of I love that Quinn like Johnson Quinn is trio. Awesome. <gasps> All right. Thank See you. See you all later. See you later. And so it seems that we have met before. And love before and love before, but who knows?